Ralph. Whoa! Did you see that, Ralph? That ugly striped son of a bitch down there. The micro genre is killer crocodile movies, and forgive me for rushing this intro. Normally, I wouldn't count a micro genre that has 24 movies, but eight of them are sequels, and some don't really even qualify. Maybe. We'll get into it. I think when you say killer croc, most people in my circles, the circles that I travel in, would think of this. Not me, shorty. Uh, yeah, you, dude. For real, though, that makeup is sick. Easily the best part of that entire movie, in my opinion. Mm. I'm beautiful. Yeah, you are, but you're not the killer croc that we're talking about today. I mean, actual killer crocodiles in survival slash horror style movies. <laughs> He'll get over it. I was going to start off by looking at the difference between crocodiles and alligators since some of these movies are antisocial alligator movies. But after a bit of reading and considering the time issue for this video, I think we can just say it doesn't really matter. There's no difference that I could explain to you that's going to affect the authenticity of a movie like Zombie Croc. And while it's fun to do some background research for context, this isn't that kind of episode. So they could have different snout shapes or different teeth placement that would differentiate them from one another. But both top out in real life at their largest at about 20 feet long and about a thousand pounds. And most of these movie crocs are gonna blow right past that. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Usually, these movies play out like a basic slasher movie. Our cast encounters the crocodile and then get picked off one at a time, but in some cases it's different. Our first movie is an excellent example of different. <sighs> I was not expecting to start my list with a Toby Hooper movie, but it turns out Hooper's second film after Texas Chainsaw Massacre is this much less celebrated weirdo movie about a hotel out in the sticks whose Norman Bates-like caretaker enjoys feeding travelers to his pet crocodile. This is a great follow-up to Texas Chainsaw. It's very much an ancestor of House of a Thousand Corpses with seedy and creepy locations and larger-than-life freak show characters. Had the saturated colors and slightly surreal atmosphere that Hooper created been an inspiration for Rob Zombie when he was envisioning his first movie, it would not be the least surprising to me. I don't know what you expect. Robert Englund plays a role. Name's Buck. I'm rearing to Functionally, I think the croc is used tastefully, and the entire film is such a great fresh twist on the genre looking back retroactively. Hooper's story was taken from a real-life situation where a guy was feeding women to his crocodiles in Florida, but this is the only movie on this list to lean towards Hitchcock's Psycho, which reinvented another real-life serial killer, Ed Gein. So he's taking the basics of Psycho, mixing them with the aesthetics of Texas Chainsaw, and then dropping in a big-ass crocodile. I have a sense that this movie will only be appreciated more as time goes on. And to that point, I would say that when it came out, there wasn't an audience for Texas Chainsaw or Eaten Alive. But decades later, there are now entire genres of horror that run a direct line back to these movies. As modern audiences continue to look back, I think some of the less heralded titles will shine more and Eaten Alive is one of those. This is a true exploitation horror movie. It's not even really that similar in format as the majority of the rest of the films on this list, which are more focused on the crocodile as the villain, where in this one, the croc is more of a background player to our human slasher killer. Most of the Killer Crocodile movies on this list, and damn near the entire genre, owes some debt to Jaws, and The Great Alligator in 1979 is a great example. It's great. You're doing great. This Italian production, directed by Sergio Martino, is the third in a trinity of Martino films filmed in Sri Lanka with his crew after Mountain of the Cannibal God and The Island of the Fishmen, which was only made years prior. 
The performances are all right. Uh, the cast boasts Bond girl Barbara Bach, but the alligator in question's pretty stiff and unconvincing. Now, let's talk about Jaws. As I said, a great portion of the movies on this list owe much to Steven Spielberg's Jaws from 1975. Not just in the production troubles of working on water or the skills or risks in revealing too much or too little of the beast as to not ruin the suspension of disbelief the audience needs in order to make the monster come to life and keep us captivated. The great alligator, like Jaws, focuses around a tourist resort. And once it's known there could be a killer animal out there threatening tourism, people in power want to pretend like it isn't happening to protect their bottom line. This, of course, does not go well. This is the Jaws template that many of these movies utilize. Jaws, of course, also boasts a trinity of characters that are reused in many of these crocodile films. We usually get the sheriff, the scientist, and the hunter. In Jaws, Roy Scheider was the town police chief Martin Brody. Uh, level-headed and trying to do what's right and not get caught up in the bureaucracy of tourism and politics. Richard Dreyfus played the marine biologist Hooper, who knows the science and expertise from an intellectual angle. And Robert Shaw as Quint was the hunter, the survivor, often a little kooky or eccentric, usually older and grizzled. Now, as an aside, director Kevin Smith, when he made Mallrats, he introduced Brody and T.S. Quint, and in Chasing Amy, he created Hooper, the character of Hooper, and those three are an homage to Jaws, as is the scene in Chasing Amy where three characters are See sharing this? scars that they got from sexual misadventures. That's as far as I can move my neck to the right. You will find this dynamic trio of characters at the heart of a bunch of these films, including the upcoming Lake Placid, Lake Placid 2, Dark Age, and our next film, Alligator, from 1980. <sighs> We've all heard the urban legend of the sewer alligators in New York and other cities, the idea being that a parent would buy their kids baby alligators and when they grew too big they would be flushed down the toilets or dumped into sewers where they would grow to full size. This isn't likely to be a super common occurrence based on how cold the water in the sewers get and reptiles are cold blooded, but that hasn't stopped a number of sightings over the decades that keep the fo folklore, the folklore alive. The Robert Forster movie Alligator from 1980 is the perfect vehicle for that urban legend to be immortalized on screen. And that's the movie in a nutshell, really. This cop is tracking down an alligator in the sewers that's been killing people. Forrester is great, as you would expect. Tarantino based the character of Max Cherry from Jackie Brown on this character in this movie specifically, so next time you watch Jackie Brown, just imagine that 15 years earlier he had hunted and killed a mutant crocodile. What are you looking at? Uh, the, the patch on the back, the thinning of the front, you know what I mean? Same thing, same thing. Oh, I, I guess I got a little sensitive about my hair a few years ago. It started falling out, so, you know, I did something about it. Most of the monster is effective and decently hidden the shadows for most of this movie. Wait a minute, I got it. There you go, unroll it one more. one final item of interest, but in his book My Life in Parts, Brian Cranston explained how he actually worked on the movie early in his career in the special effects department and packed the gator full of the fake blood and guts for the final explosion scene. <laughs> None of the cast or crew of characters carry forward to the sequel, Alligator, Alligator 2, The, the mutation, mutation, in 1991. Now, technically, the gator in the first movie is also a mutation, but since this movie put mutation in the title, it's worth mentioning now that mutations are a regular theme for these kinds of killer crocodile movies. Normal-sized alligators aren't that exciting when they're a regular sighting in Florida, and ever since four turtles were covered in mutagen in the mid-80s, everything mutant and reptilian went hand in hand. The Ninja Turtles even had their own mutant alligator named Leatherhead. Your head is kind of leathery. How about head leather? Heather? No, wait! Leatherhead! Just know that we see a lot of mutant gators in the genre going forward. And for its part, Alligator 2, the mutation, doesn't add much to the lore, retreading the same ground. Okay, 
Alligator 2 came out in 1991, but we need to jump back to 1986 to catch Australia's Dark Age. The film opens with a title card prologue about how important crocodiles are culturally to Australia. And then we see this guy from Crocodile Dundee. This movie's strange and interesting for a bunch of reasons. First off, it's really, really good looking. Really, really, really ridiculously good looking? I mean, the photography for the film is really sharp. The score has got a cool synth, rhythmic thing going. The story's compelling and well delivered by the actors, and then it never gets released in Australia theatrically. We're talking 1986. It's the same year that Crocodile Dundee came out, and I'm watching this movie thinking, this could compete with Dundee. Not really compete, but it could be in the next theater playing at the same time. No slouch. Two Australian crocodile movies. One funny, the other one a disciple of Jaws. There's very much the sense of Jaws throughout Dark Age. Um, the killer animal terrorizing the locals and them going hunting for it. The town mayor or whoever wants to downplay the threat so the tourists aren't scared off. But the killings keep happening until we get our trinity of heroes again. The park ranger, the aboriginal shaman, and his nephew from Crocodile Dundee who are going to go it alone. The thing about being a copycat movie is that it's totally fine as long as you make a good movie, and Dark Age is definitely one of those. The hero of the movie is played by John Jarrett, who is perhaps best known as Mick Taylor, the main antagonist of the Wolf Creek slasher movies. That isn't super relevant, but it will be when we get about 20 years down the road on this list. So remember, John Jarrett starred in Dark Age. The croc itself is largely effective by its absence and implied presence, but just like Jaws, when we show too much, it ruins the illusion. Still, Dark Age is a high point for sure on this list. There are a pair of Italian productions shot in the Dominican Republic that tackle the topic titled Killer Alligator in 1989 and Killer Alligator 2 in 1990, which were filmed back to back as one production. We're following a team of ecologists who are investigating toxic waste being dumped in this river, but it's already too late and the local alligator has mutated into a monster. These are pretty good exploitation movies that tick all the boxes for this subgenre. It's another mutation, it owes a lot to Jaws, the score, even, in the opening credits as we get the croc vision point of view camera is a total bite of the Jaws theme as well. The alligator itself is maybe the weakest link, unless you're into the styrofoam stuffed look for a cheesy croc monster that's largely overexposed in this movie with all its static kills where it has to wait for people to like fall into its open mouth so not so scary but it does win the most gruesome over-the-top gator death by far though i'm not sure I could even show this on YouTube, but let's just say a power tool is thrown into its open mouth and then it starts twisting around like a blender with the gut and then it, they blow it up and they're watching it burn there. So it is up there for crazy gator deaths. It's actually so crazy that the sequel, Killer Alligator 2 in 1990, opens with the end scene of part one replayed. And it's not the only scene that gets reused for flashbacks, which is a fair amount of screen time. Some of the cast comes back and the movies were shot at the same time, but all in all, honestly, once I think you've seen the first movie, you're not missing really anything if you skip the second one. But on the other hand, uh, if you're particularly sensitive about the poor quality of computer-generated crocodiles, our next Killer Croc movie makes them the new standard, so maybe you want to cling to every cheesy, practical foam croc that you can get at this point. I was trying to figure out what was the first killer crocodile movie that I'd ever seen in a film, and I think it was Eraser in 1997. Maybe because of the progress made with CGI in Jurassic Park, 
but before that, maybe Crocodile Dundee. Of course, that was a comedy. Other people might remember having uh, seen James Bond hopping over the crocodiles in Live and Let Die, but for me, it was definitely a racer. And I think that this movie might be single-handedly the reason why there were so many of these killer crocodile horror pictures in the 2000s and beyond. I think CGI piggybacks off of the movies that precede it rather well, and as unbelievable as these crocs were interacting with water in 1997, there are still plenty of these movies over a decade later that don't even really improve much on it. Water's tough, and most horror movies don't have the financial muscle to get that compositing done well. Lake Placid in 1999 was the next rung on that ladder. This might be the most mainstream Hollywood effort of all the movies on this list. It boasts real stars like Bill Pullman, and Bridget Fonda, Oliver Platt, and the late, great Betty White. If I had a dick, this is where I'd tell you to suck it. Even when they're not stars, veteran actors like Brendan Gleeson lend their talent uh, that gives that extra credibility to the cast. The croc is pretty damn effective, even in the CGI bits. I guess that's what happens when you let a master like Stan Winston take a crack at it. The director is Steve Miner. Uh, Steve's the man who gave Jason his hockey mask, directing parts two and three of Friday the 13th, as well as House in 1985, personal favorite. And if the playful banter between characters in the movie catches your attention, note that it was written by David E. Kelly, creator of Doogie Howser, Chicago Hope, Picket Fences, The Practice, Boston Legal, Boston Public. It goes on and it goes on. Uh, the movie is generally enjoyable. It's half comedic and half adventure type romp, although I will point out one weird inconsistency that you would think would matter. Melville Dewey, the creator of the, the Dewey Decimal System, is from Lake Placid, New York. Singer Lana Del Rey uh, grew up in Lake Placid, New York. Lake Placid the movie takes place at a fictional black lake in Maine. So it's not like Placid. How, how does that make any sense? I don't think it does, so I no, no sense. The croc is claimed to have a 32 foot length and wouldn't you know it, standing in for Black Lake, Maine is Vancouver and Surrey, which is right next to Vancouver, uh, with three lakes that stand in for Lake Placid, uh, which is not Lake Placid. Shawnigan Lake, Bunsen Lake, Hayward Lake. They're all three less than an hour from where I'm sitting right now. I don't think it was ever really a scary movie in the horror genre, but I do think that it's a fun and enjoyable movie overall, and while I don't think it warranted so many sequels, here we are. There are other movies worth focusing on before the five direct-to-video Lake Placid sequels, but we're here now, so let's run them through really quickly. Uh, the second movie is a retread of the first, the same sheriff, biologist, and rich pompous hunter dynamic going on and stepping in as Betty White's sister is Cloris Leachman. The third movie introduces Yancey Butler from the live-action Witchblade TV series and my personal favorite, Drop Zone, with Wesley Snipes. She plays the tough lady hero in the third movie and then continues to the fourth movie called The Final Chapter, where they add Robert Englund to the cast. And then both of them return in the follow-up to The Final Chapter for Lake Placid vs. Anaconda which I guess does cross over with the Anaconda franchise, although it really just ends up being another snake. So I don't know how that works. They're completely different snakes and crocs in each movie. So you might just wonder how these franchises crossing over even work. And it's not just random crocodile versus random snake, the movie, right? Have you ever heard of the blood orchid? Well, actually, yes, I have. So if you really want to know, the Anaconda franchise had a similar number of four direct-to-video sequels, and they had built their movie lore around the Blood Orchid, which is a fictional plant that was introduced and continued throughout the series due to its medicinal potential to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in the fourth movie, John Rhys Davies plays J.D. Murdoch, a billionaire, dying of cancer or something that the Blood Orchid could fix. And in Anaconda vs. Lake Placid, we bring back the Blood Orchid and introduce us to Murdoch's crazy daughter. You see? <laughs> no, it all connects, I guess. Uh, and then after that, there's even one more sequel called Lake Placid Legacy that features Joey Pants from The Matrix, remember? The Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. The Matrix is telling my brain this is turkey jerky. 
Well, my brain is telling me that we need to move along now. So stick with the classic Placid. And if you venture into the direct-to-video sequels, parts three, four, and versus Anaconda make a funky little trilogy. While these unnecessary sequels were, were tumbling out over two decades following Lake Placid, we skipped over some non-Placid alligator movies. So let's go back to 2000. It was pretty crazy to think that Toby Hooper would kick off our list with Eaten Alive, but what would be even crazier is if he directed a second Killer Crocodile movie in 2000 called simply Crocodile, but that is in fact our reality that we're living in right now. Now, no idea why he came back to the croc pits to take another swing at the old leatherheads, but here we are. Bunch of teens on a houseboat are attacked by a big crocodile. It doesn't get more complicated than that, really. Crocodile came out only one year after Lake Placid, so this could have been an attempt to draft off of some kind of big Hollywood heat in the industry and video stores, which is most likely the place where you're going to see Crocodile. It's hard to believe that the same guy who directed both of these movies, one being pretty much exactly what you'd want to see and expect from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre guy, and the other one is so bland and generic that you probably forget that you even saw it at all. If you're only going to see one, make it eaten alive. Now, I'm not exactly sure who thought that croc movies were going to be the next big trend, but after Lake Placid in 1999, Crocodile in 2000, we got Blood Surf in 2001. Blood Surf. A bunch of friends travel to a tropical location to capture video footage of them surfing in shark-infested waters for a promotional stunt. And sharks are cool, apparently. But once they get on land, they're attacked by a savage killer crocodile. I know. What a twist. Uh, one of the highlights of the movie has to be poor man's Rudger Hauer, the banker himself, Duncan Ruger. You think this is fodder for some cheap entertainment? Most of these killer croc movies need a crazy old hunter guy, and Ruger is a perfect fit. Let me tell you something, boy. I watched this crocodile eat five kids. All about your age. It's not the best, but... Well, let's just leave it at it's not the best. Ruger's great. He deserves better than Bloodsucker. All right. Welcome to 2007, when we got a quartet of Killer Crocodile movies in one year. Five, if you go and you count Lake Placid 2, but we already covered that one earlier. I have to wonder whether any of these four movies could have been more successful if they didn't have these other very similar movies competing in such a niche genre. We have good movies on our list, and we have terrible movies, and Rogue is definitely one of the better titles. This is no blood surf. I've mentioned Rogue before in a previous video about riverboat movies, and now we get to discuss this movie in a bit more detail. As far as the plot's concerned, it's simple. Tourists take a boat ride in Australia, and the boat gets stuck, and the crocs get hungry. It has great, beautiful photography, good performances, and a tight script, well-written. The croc is better than most, if not all, the other crocs on this list. Genre fans might recognize our lead, Rada Mitchell, uh, best from Pitch Black, the debut of a Vin Diesel action star. As a genre stooge myself, I wish Rada Mitchell would lend her skills to more exploitation films like this. Great actors tend to lend uh, otherwise silly movies a certain gravity. Uh, Sam Worthington is also in it, as well as John Jarrett. Remember when I said that he would return in 20 years? Well, here we are. Second great Australian killer crocodile movie and John Jarrett returns. Uh, the film's directed by Greg McLean, who previously had directed modern slasher classic Wolf Creek, and then also Wolf Creek 2, and John Jarrett, as I mentioned before, is the lead of both of those as well. It's a solid movie, highly recommended. Also in 2007, Blackwater told the real-life story of survivors of a croc attack. <laughs> The movie is very similar in plot to Rogue, and Rogue does feel a little bit more like a polished Hollywood movie in a good way, 
whereas Black Water as a less sensational and still pretty effective taut survival thriller, it works well. The performances of the principal cast are very excellent, drawing you in. This could have almost been a riverboat movie, except they're stuck in a grove of trees, but not actually in a river. Or if it is a river, it's so wide you don't actually ever get to see the shore. I think Rogue did better with its showing the croc and that Blackwater exercises excellent restraint at not showing theirs for most of the screen time, making it the threat more of a psychological and more realistic. There's also a sequel called Blackwater Abyss, which came out in 2020, following the same idea, but this time our gator bait decided to go cave diving in the croc-infested outback. Everything's fine until a flash flood fills the cave and blocks their way out. I think Blackwater Abyss did a good job of making me care about the characters in the story and their interpersonal drama, even though a croc was picking them off one at a time. The croc was handled tastefully, and I won't ruin the ending for anybody, but the last 10 minutes or so take some turns that kind of soured me on the movie right at the end. It just went over the top, which is great if you're Crank 2 or Revenge of the Fallen, but after 80 minutes of establishing a vibe, I just thought the ending blew it for something more sensational. Neither production is flashy, uh, but they're both effective and well done. Our third 2007 croc movie is titled Croc and is more of that Jaws Lake Placid plot where a killer croc or crocs start killing people at a resort in Thailand and the main character is the owner of a croc farm and his crocs are framed for the killings and then Michael Madsen is our hunter character brought in to hunt the beast. They think I'm here to kill their enemy. Yeah, well, that's, that's what you're going to do, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to kill it. Right. This doesn't boast the best dialogue or performance, and that's no slam against Madsen, who I think is all right. I'm talking about entirely other actors. The fact that it's in Thailand is interesting, because in doing research for this video, I discovered a history with Thailand and their own killer crocodile movies, and I decided to make it its own micro-genre video, so look out for that soon. This production looks a little bit on the cheaper side because it's part of a production deal. Uh, a bundle of 10 natural horror killer animal movies is a package called the Man Eater series and it premiered on channels like Sci-Fi. The series runs for 28 of these made for TV efforts, but a look down the list and man eating animal concept seems to be abandoned with the titles that start featuring werewolves and gargoyles and yetis and aliens and hellhounds. So the production might be direct to TV thin, but getting the benefit of shooting in Thailand got them some great shots of real crocodiles. Still, they also found themselves needing CG for specific shots and they go about it as you might expect. Though, this movie does give us the best electric croc death. fourth entry from 2007 is Prime Evil, and it's not a dud, but it's not reinventing the genre. This time we're in Burundi, Africa, and while the plot isn't super engaging, there are some familiar faces. Dominic Purcell, Jurgen Prock now as our old hunter archetype, and the great Orlando Jones. Is he good? He's waving at you! Ha 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 ha! The movie was originally titled Gustav, after a very real killer crocodile in Burundi. The movie tells a fictional version of the basic elements of what happened there in the early 2000s as a team of scientists attempted to catch Gustav within a month before the country plunged into a civil war. They failed, and Gustav is very much alive as far as we know. This was all in a documentary called Capturing the Killer Croc on PBS in 2004, and that's kind of where I think that Primeval runs into trouble. There's already a documentary with the real events of a story from only three years ago, why would you want to see the Hollywoodized version in a year when your attention is also divided by three or four other crocodile movies? The croc in this one is actually pretty good in most shots, or at least it's better than most of the subpar crocs that populate this list. 
Out of the four, I would still choose Rogue, but this one's a close second for the Crocodile at least, Blackwater's second for the plot. Okay, we're pretty low in our bucket of crabs here. There's only a few more titles to go, but also Alligator X is maybe the worst feature on this list. It's another sci-fi channel monster mess with a few familiar faces like Lachlan Monroe, Mark Shepard, and rapper Paul Wall. The other thing about this movie is it's not actually an alligator or a crocodile, but rather a clone of a dinosaur. So it's really only on the list because it's called Alligator X, but it was also released as Extinction Predator X. I'm guessing to put Predator in the title to sell it better. And since I mentioned this one, I will say that I'm aware that there's a Dino Croc and a Super Gator, the Roger Corman movies, but they're also both more monster movie fare and dinosaurs rather than crocodiles. So we got to draw the line somewhere, otherwise we're going to be here all day. The last word on this title before we move on, I don't like slagging movies much. People aren't trying to make crap, but I wanted to play this short clip to show you what you'd be stepping into if you choose to watch Extinction Predator X. Just watch how quickly the sun sets in the scene. It's from the shirt I just pulled from the engine. That blood looks fresh. No! 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 Matt! Wait, where is she going? Our only Chinese movie on this list, Croczilla, aka Million Dollar Crocodile, has been touted online as the first Chinese entry into the genre, which I would assume means the killer crocodile movie. But honestly, the movie is described as a horror thriller, it has a PG-13 rating, and I thought it was intentionally a comedy adventure when I watched it. Crocodile? 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 The marketing was all pointing in the direction of a serious movie, or a huge mutant Godzilla-sized crocodile, or at the least leading one to believe this would feature a genetically modified crocodile with some dinosaur DNA or something. But instead, this is a movie about a family that owns a crocodile habitat that is tricked into giving their crocodiles to what end up being poachers who want to chop up the gators for soup. Instead, the big one escapes, it runs into a fashion icon and eats her purse, with a million dollars in it, and then she involves the police to try and get it back for her, like a caper. It's scary when it wants to be, but it's also funny, and as scary as it gets, that PG-13 rating isn't going to do anything for its reputation. The reptile himself, a Mao, is well represented given how much screen time he's got. However, the best part of Croczilla is that it's the only movie to really give the croc some sense of motivation. He's the real victim here. He was taken from his peaceful habitat. He wakes up to find his children or family slaughtered in front of him. Even when he's attacked later, we get a flash of recognition as Amau relates this machete to the one that chopped up his family like a, like a Rambo Nam flashback. And that makes this movie pretty unique in my opinion. Okay, let's not spend much time on this one. I have a very low tolerance for movies that are filmed on VHS or that straight to video look. It's no offense to the VHS filmmakers, but aesthetically I haven't found much in that format that holds my attention personally. To be fair, this, this movie looks like a labor of love and there was a bunch of effort going into making this look like an old scratched up 1970s film print with color fading and flickering. This would have made a great trailer between Grindhouse features. This could have been all right at a tight 75 minutes, but at 105, I just didn't think it held up. Not enough croc. And when we did get it, it just wasn't the best.
For our last movie on this list, I was pretty exhausted and fatigued and ready to move on, but I have to say Crawl was a pretty tight survival thriller and I was entertained. Uh, they finally really nailed the crocodile. CG, practical, they worked on screen. The movie is about a daughter that goes looking for her dad during a hurricane in Florida. They get trapped in a sub-basement or a crawl space underneath the house where the alligators have been hanging out since the water had risen. What makes it especially fresh to me on this list is that for the most part the gators are not giant mutants and although they do seem particularly nasty and aggressive, they come across more as real animals than malevolent murdering masters. Masterminds. I also appreciated that they weren't immortal or invulnerable, and we got to see some humans fighting back, which seems realistic to me. You know, take out a croc and then there's still three more. It's still a threat, but at least it seems like the humans aren't completely incapable. Most of the time when a killer gator gets a victim in its jaws, they thrash around a bit and make a show in these movies, but that's about it, right? Like, you're not really fighting back. Here, we see that they aren't deadly assassins, but they are dangerous, and in greater numbers, they're going to be a real problem. It's still got its cheesy moments, but overall I think it's a nice addition to the Killer Gator movie library. So that's about it. One thing we didn't talk about is the way that a crocodile kills its prey. I threw a rock at him! It was a big rock. I, I was thinking something a little more specific to crocodiles. A death rock. Yeah. Yeah, see, a croc will grab you, take you down to the bottom of the water, and roll you over and over and over until you stop kicking. And he'll take you away to his meat safe somewhere. Yeah, the death roll. You're seriously telling me that over 20 killer crocodile movies and not a single one is called The Death Roll? And I know it's a terrible name for a movie, come on, but if Blood Surf gets to be the title of a terrible movie, then Death Roll deserves to get an equally crappy movie of its own.